about a zap or two. <laughs> what is that? It's one of those things that electric. Oh, it's what is that? It's a taser? It electrocutes like, people? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Where did you get it? Here? Same place I bought the Dreamer. I can't remember the name of the um, place. The Brain Machine. What is shop. it like? An import shop or something? Is this? Not necessarily. No, I think it was. I think most. And of this stuff is the Dreamer. Here. Yeah, this is the Dreamer. Did you and try it? I've tried it. Yes. What did you dream about? Oh, <laughs> I dreamed about German shepherds and having sex with my stepfather and mm -hmm. eating flowers and no smoking yeah. pop potpourri. How do you pronounce that? Potpourri. Potpourri. Yeah. Right. I like to smoke potpourri. Like, can you choose what kind of dreams you can have with this machine? No, no, just... no. It's it's not necessarily dreams. It is a um, it's there are like one, two, three, six different functions. Right. They're programs, and they and they basically just help with stress, insomnia, relaxation, creativity, um, concentration, and meditation. That's funny. Like uh, the stress key, does it t take it to a stress situation, or a condition? Is that it, it? It it would relieve you of stress. Right. And these Ooh, are anyway. these are the glasses, and they're uh, I don't know all the technical terminology for exactly how to explain it but they they flash red lights mm -hmm. on and off in different patterns so and they and they coincide with the with your alpha and and whatever other right. alpha and beta but waves in your brain and then there's a there's a sound that goes along with that also it's you really amazing it do really you have works. to keep your eyes open to no you close your eyes it's just like staring into the sun and going you can feel the flashes of it. yeah you can see the flashes and That's after weird. a while, it, the, um, it, you don't see red anymore. You see all these different patterns of different colors and stuff. It's really yeah. neat, and it relaxes you. <coughs> Excuse me. But I can't sure. demonstrate can it because I have the wrong voltage. Right. But I look like I'm in a techno band, like the shaman or something, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> looks like looks like some of those um, virtual reality machines. Did you yeah, that's try basically one? what this is. I haven't tried one though. I, I'm really interested in that stuff. But I can't, I can't find any any places where I would be able to try one out yet. Do you do you think that stuff, uh, some uh, something like that would help you when you're in the studio, like trying to create or to do something? And it, that's not the purpose you're using. Um, I hope so. I've only just tested it for one hour today, mm. and I was, I was pleased with the results. It really made me feel good. Good. It, it really made me feel relaxed. That's so good. Great. That's good. Uh, I was going to ask you about relaxing because everybody's taking good time here in Brazil, taking vacation. All the other bands mm -hmm. are in the festival, and you are in the studio working. Why is that? You do you have? Well, to we're not necessarily working. We're just um, um, practicing, just trying to make songs because the studio was available, mm -hmm. and um, we just like to jam sometimes. So we decided to. Um, do a little bit of pre-production for our next record, see what the ne new songs would sound like, record it, and, and maybe add some parts and just make up for some songs, you know? But uh, you, Nirvana's not in the kind of pressure to do a new album, you know, that's why, not why you're working here in Rio, or...? or no, not no, no, I don't think we're really under pressure. I mean, we have enough songs for the new album, but we would like to have more. We'd like to have more to choose from, definitely. We have about maybe 13 songs. And we begin recording in the second week of February, so mm -hmm. that's pretty soon. And we're only allowing ourselves two weeks to record, right. to record and mix, and that's it. That's that's the album. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do it in time, we're not going to put out an album. Right, but you don't have any date specifically to put this album out. I mean, are, are no plans in the plan? The no, plans? except we have a date to record. We have to record the second, starting the second week of February. Second week of February, right? right. And uh. So in Brazil here, it's, it was very spontaneous that you were working in the studio here. Uh, and I was wondering, how was the show in Sao Paulo for you? And did you feel confident enough to try some more new songs on the show? You tried just one, right? In Sao Paulo? Mm, I don't remember. You guess, you guess it was just one, or at least... Mm, I think announced. we played a couple of new songs. And then we did some new wave songs, you know, right. when we started jamming and stuff. But um, for the most part... We don't want to over-practice the new songs. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a good idea to, to play new songs, you know, to, that, to see what the vibe is like live, but 
I guess I don't have an explanation why we didn't play more new songs, really. <laughs> but I, well, maybe Normally we do, but it's, uh, and a while ago we got so tired of people bootlegging stuff, and we want the new album to be more or less a surprise. We don't want anyone to know what the new songs sound like, because it'd be bootlegged like that, and everyone would, wouldn't you know, be a surprise hearing the new songs. Well, the, the press is talking about the, the, this new record that they say is going to be more heavy. I mean, can you give us any hint of that? What, what is heavy yeah what is heavy yeah can you, can you define something like that um i who said it was going to be heavier i read it in rolling stone maybe uh, fuck man what would they know yeah you know, and you're not you're not uh going towards any specific direction direction or heavy direction or so i think we're going in more of a, an experimental new wave mm. type of direction it's kind of hard to explain actually have you heard the Incesticide record? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of band we used to be. We used to be more um, like like Gang of Four, New Wave influence, like more experimental with more noise mm -hmm. and different effects boxes and stuff. Right. And um, and then we started getting too much into straight ahead garage grunge music, and mm -hmm. that's pretty much what what Bleach was like. And then Nevermind was more pop, a little bit more commercial. And now we're kind of reverting back to the first thing, which would sound more like incesticide, just weirder stuff. W was that intentional, this, this kind of evolution? I mean, you going towards commercial songs? And, uh, we, we just happened to be really into the, the idea at the time. It seemed like a, a really challenging idea at mm -hmm. the time because we were playing punk rock underground clubs and we thought it would be really funny to test that out on, on those kind of people to mm -hmm. see if they would be able to swallow more of a clean pop you know sound and see if we can get away with it because we love that kind of music we like a lot of commercial music that's good you know mm -hmm. most of it's old most of the old commercial stuff we like but um it was just something to do we just do we're pretty much bored with that phase now because there's or you're really limited, when, especially when you're a three-piece, right. you know, because right. there's not much you can do with you know, three-chord guitar rock. Not really. Well, the whole new wave concept, I mean, when it began, it was very pop. I mean, can, can you oh, yeah. It, you know, like, if yeah. you can name any bands, you, you, you mentioned well, like the Gang B-52 or Devo, or, you know, anything. They were pretty pop, and they were not, like, Ramones. betraying anything. Or no, no. The, 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 I think that's one of the most grossest periods of music in, in history is right around the mid 80s when when this crossover metal and punk rock thing started happening where it wasn't cool to write songs that had melody anymore it had right. to be total noise and aggression all the time and I, I just got really sick of that is there an ashtray around here somewhere no can you get one you <laughs> see thanks uh and so this wave now is gone i mean this this I'm middle cool. 80s senseless or pointless rock, right? I mean, because of, of grunge and all this new so-called alternative. Thanks. Is that it? For us, do you for, mean? For, 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 anything? for pop music in general, for rock. I mean, do you think, because I, I, I guess the impression, I have the impression that this kind of music will always exist. That's I think so. So, but I think it always, yeah, it, it, uh, it revolves in a circle all the time. <coughs> you know, everything will always revert back to melody I mean because that's the most palatable thing to an ear right but how do you feel about maybe there will be uh, an answer to the sound you're making now you and the, all of this bands that I that are on the top now uh, more a uh, more conservative rock or more noisy rock the kind of the rock they did in the middle 80s will come back is there a chance that this happened and how do you feel I think about it's happening it? already I mean obviously the most popular alternative bands on a, on a um, n national um, commercial scale are more, you know, commercial. They're more clean mm -hmm. and, you know, like like Pearl Jam and and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And that's the same thing that happened with with punk rock. You know, punk rock was really aggressive and raunchy, mm -hmm. and um, uh, those bands got signed to major labels, and it didn't do too well mm -hmm. in the mass media. And um, so then all these punk rock bands turned into new wave bands. You know, so mm -hmm. that's exactly what we are. We're a fucking new wave band. Mm -hmm. Well. I'm <laughs> The way things go, I mean, just yesterday uh, I, I saw. Well, it's hell. Well, I hope. I, I hope. I don't really like to think of us as just strictly one of those kind of bands who used to be punk rock and then went to a commercial um, option just for for you know 
financial reasons or mm -hmm. to be played on the radio. It was something that we sincerely wanted to do. We really liked the stuff that we were trying to do at the time. And as you said, you were trying to <coughs> tease your audience, your punk club audience, to, with yeah, the in songs. a small way. Yeah, it was more of a test. Right. It was more of a test for us actually to see if we had enough guts to um, get away with um, the acceptance by the people who we respect, because right. the people who we respect the most are the people in the underground punk rock audiences. Right. You know. But so now, now uh, about what Nirvana is trying to do now is the opposite. I mean, you're trying to challenge another kind of audience into something completely new for them. Isn't that right. more dangerous, maybe, for the band or for you? Not for us, because we don't give a shit at all now mm -hmm. what anybody thinks of us. I mean, we can get away with anything, right. pretty much. I mean, that, that's kind of a sad thing in a way, but. Um, I would definitely like to see the people who liked our band, who liked Nevermind because it was easy to listen to, mm -hmm. I would love to see them get into or um, uh, appreciate the, the noisier side of our, of our music and then hopefully maybe they will look back into some of the old punk rock bands like Black Flag and Flipper and stuff like that mm -hmm. and hopefully that and there will be other bands, current bands, who will be on major labels and they'll listen to that stuff too, you know. Right. It's not necessarily like a big crusade we're on, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, I mean, fuck, we're just a band, but, right. you know. Especially now that everybody seems to jump in the, the, the wave or the, the movement that you seems to represent now. I just heard yesterday, I was telling you that Madonna is looking for a grunge band to sign. I mean, right. how do you... Is it possible? I mean, just because she has a label and she can come with some really original sound? Well, people like that tend to think that they can buy anything, you know. I'm, I, I personally don't think that she's really sincerely into that kind of music. I wouldn't know because I don't know her as a person, so maybe she is, but to me it seems kind of superficial. It seems like a cash-in kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and an attempt to be kind of hip and get a little bit more credibility. But in a way, I respect Madonna for the things that she has introduced because she's introduced some subversive things and it has nothing to do with sex as far as I'm concerned. I'm talking about like the um, introduction to the Vogue dance which originated in the gay clubs in the, in the mid 80s and early 80s. Uh, and stuff like that, and she's always been supportive of things like that, which right. is, I, I think is really cool. Right. She's just from a different world, you know, so I don't expect her to understand mm -hmm. punk rock, because, I mean, obviously she knew about punk rock. She had to, she, you know, she was hanging out in, in New York at that time, and she uh, chose to um, ignore it, yeah. so but are, are, that was her choice. The, the big public, would, they would buy it anyway just because it's, it's a Madonna's business now, wouldn't they? I mean, they, do they care for superficiality or, uh, or if, if they just have a, a name attached to the, 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 the record they would buy? Oh, this, this band might be superficial, but it's, she is producing that. How, how superficial are consumers and all that? The mess, mess. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say right now because it seems like people well, generally, people are, are looking for things that are a bit more sincere and real now. Mm. I, I, I try to be optimistic enough to, to hope that people are, 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 being out, are, are looking towards things like that. You know. is, is this happening with, uh, I mean, with rock, even European rock? How much can you say about European rock, uh, English rock, maybe? Because this is very uh, true with, with American rock. But, uh, you mentioned New Wave, and a good part of New Wave came from, from England. I think some absolutely amazing um, and very influential bands came from, from England and, mm -hmm. and Europe, all over. Mm -hmm. But that was in the early 80s, and they weren't afraid to experiment. Like, you know, bands like the Raincoats and Kleenex and stuff like that. I mean, right. fantastic right. music. But the way that I see the current British rock scene is very. Um, I think they're more. I think they're more interested in a, um, an interesting um, um, character. It, more interesting characters in the band, like people who give better interviews than they do music. You know, and it's very fashion conscious and very trendy. And 
I don't really dig it at all myself. There's not very many English bands I can think of that I like. In fact, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know there are a few. I know there are, but I just can't really think of any of them. But uh, bands, England, English bands from early 80s, I remember uh, uh, an interview with you, you said something like the 10 most important records for you, and one of them was from a band called Young Marble Giants, mm -hmm. which is, I, I thought I, <laughs> I was the only person that listened to that. Uh, I mean, it was very, very, it's a very, si it's a very simple record at all. Yeah. Can, can you say it's like, how close is it to your intentions in music? Because it was this, this, this record from Young Marble Giants. I, I'm heavily influenced by them. It doesn't sound like it in our music, but mm -hmm. I, they're just, they're, um, the, the emotions they evoked and the, the feeling, the, the sincerity and all that. Mm -hmm. It's just, and, and the songwriting I think is fantastic. And it's so original too, you know, no drums, you know, except for the little mm -hmm. Dick Casio thing. Mm -hmm. Great. And I just love that stuff. So, uh, it has to do with pu purity. I say that, purity too, yeah. in terms of music. And that's why Nirvana is all about purity of music, right? I, w I would like to think that we, there's some. There's some purity in this, yeah. Naive, naive purposely also. naive. <laughs> well, it had the whole attitude during the show in Sao Paulo. I'm talking about it. It was naivety, I, I think. And how much a, a, a huge crowd of 50,000 can get this message of purity or naivety? Does it matter how big is the show for you to send this message? Well, you that's kind of a hard thing. That's kind of a hard question to answer because it's. <clears throat> it's flattering to know that we are affecting that many people, but I'm I'm certain that a very good majority of the people had no idea what the fuck we were doing. You know, they had no idea that we were doing new wave covers and trying to have fun and trading off instruments and just trying to have a party atmosphere because most of them only attend those kind of arena large rock shows and they expect a very clean professional uh, performance from a band. So, you know, but. As far as I'm concerned, I would rather play in a smaller club because it's just more intimate and fun. I just, I really like it. I can hear the band. I'm closer to my bandmates and, and we can look at each other. I don't have to say, hey, Chris, 100 feet away over there, you know. Right. Well, so. and it seems like you were just playing with the, with the audience all, all the time. Like you would say, rock and roll, people would go, yeah. And they would, that was a very natural answer, but you're not serious about it, were you? When you were, we were saying things like hey, rock and roll, and people say, "Yeah, cause this is the kind of arena attitude, right?" Yeah, and yeah, because we are. Yeah, I guess we're taking the piss out of that. Right, <laughs> but that's that's okay. I mean, uh, that's that's that was the only show I ever saw from Nirvana. So that's your attitude every big show you you doing lately. Most of the time, yeah, that's one of the only ways that we can really deal with the idea, the reality of, of playing in front of that many people, because we never ever intended to do that, you know, and it was, and I've never hardly ever enjoyed seeing, uh, watching an arena rock show, I think I, I saw, I've only seen a few of them, I, I really liked Aerosmith when I saw them about 10 years ago, and that was a really big show, mm -hmm. but that's just because I liked the band so much, and I, I, you know, I was real familiar with the songs and everything, but I would have rather seen them in a, in a club, you know, or a theater of a few thousand people, for sure. Nowadays, you still go <coughs> out to clubs to see small shows? And I try to, but, um... There aren't very many bands I like right now, mm -hmm. you know. But don't so. you like trying some new sound? I mean, let's see if the, the, the boys are doing something interesting now. If, if, can you, do you have this feeling like, oh, let's let's see if I find something interesting around? Oh, something absolutely. New. Oh, absolutely, definitely. I mean, I, I, I'm constantly always buying records and, mm -hmm. and you know, a asking my friends what they like and listening to it. I mean, I, I buy so many records on tour that I still haven't listened to even half of them. I haven't had a chance to. Right, right, right. So. And uh, when a new band comes to you or you know that uh, they say that they were influenced by Nirvana, how do you take that? Because you're such a new band to influence some other people, aren't you? Or can you say that, you, yes, you, we influence other bands? Well, I don't know. I, I've never heard a band that sounds like us. I, I can't say that I've heard a band who sounds like they rip us off or, mm -hmm. or have been influenced by us and if they have been influenced by us I hope that you've been influenced by the, the sincerity we try to try to put off. Right. I don't know. 
Okay. Well, and just we're finishing now. Uh, you were given an interview to a fanzine before us, okay? And how much were you are still involved with this underground world? I mean, this uh, fanzine stuff. I mean, you'd rather do a fanzine interview? Oh, than much more. Well, any t any day of the week, yeah, I'd rather do that. Because, because the big press, does it misquote you a lot? They don't understand, and I just don't read those kind of magazines. I, I read fanzines all the time, and those are the only things that I ever really read. Normally, I don't really even care what my favorite bands have to say, you know? Because I know they probably, you know, agree, I agree with pretty much the same philosophies and, and ideas that they do anyhow, mm -hmm. if we're into the same kind of music, or basically the same kind of music, so... You know, that's just a second. That's just like the icing on the cake. That's just an, you know, an extra little thing. Right. You, you yourself, know, so. do you see things that you said that you are often misquoted a lot in, in the press? Constantly. Ninety-eight percent of the time. Yeah. And how much? But not with fanzines usually because they understand us. But mm -hmm. with with other with other magazines, and there are a lot of magazines that just don't give a shit. They, they purposely misquote you just mm -hmm. to have a funny story, you know, or just to fuck with you, or to, right. you know, just to make their, to sell their magazine, because that's right. the only reason they're in it. Anyways. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, one final question, because in Bloom, Law is like number one video on MTV here, so I want to ask oh, you one, really? one question about it. Uh, the same laugh that it seems that you were taking with the audience at, this, at the show in Sao Paulo. You were taking with video watchers within Bloom, right? Which, which was a totally simple video at all. I mean, uh, what, how intentional was that? I mean, well, you don't like videos, or how come you, you made you made you made maybe smells like conspiracy in the same purpose? <laughs> and now you said no. Uh, in Bloom, the in Bloom video is like a, it's the beginning of an answer all that, even to, to MTV or to the whole uh, video uh, universe? Mm. Hmm. I'm not really sure because I, I'm, not, I'm not really opposed to videos. I don't, I don't, I don't hate them. Uh, sometimes they're fun to do. Especially that video was fun to do because it only took us six hours. <laughs> Normally a video will take it the whole day, just like really? over and over and over. We only had to listen to the song like four times and it was great. So it was really great to be able to do that, and it was totally spontaneous. Um, Courtney um, had brought some dresses with her. She was taking them to a friend's house, or she didn't know she had borrowed some dresses from a friend of hers. And so I thought, hey, let's put some dresses on and you know dance around in those. And that was just, you know, everything was just pretty much spontaneous. The 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 basic idea was just to. Um, you know, do a video that looked like it came from the early 60s or, or, the, or the late 50s. Well, what, about, what about the other version that you were more with suits and all like that? You know, it was done in the same day? Yeah. Just, you just changed your clothes? And yeah, you we just changed our clothing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and you mentioned that Courtney came with that, those dresses and she's recording right here. I mean, do you by any chance interview with what she's doing uh, some in, in her work or how much does one uh, interferes with other works? Um, yeah, we get in each other's way every once in a while. <laughs> well, well I mean, yeah, but I mean, more, uh, more uh, intentional. Uh, we, well, we, we just like to be together all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're best friends. She's my best friend, and so when she's playing music, I like to listen to it and maybe suggest some things, and she does the same thing with me, too. And, um, She's just. This was just an opportunity for her to. She she came with us, and and her and Patty, her drummer, came too. Uh, it's just a vacation, and so this was just a, a, a spontaneous thing for them to just make a, a few demos and see what they're gonna do with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, it's rolling. Arnaldo Baptista. Is that how you pronounce his name? That's it. Mm -hmm. Where? I said, where, where, where did you hear from them? I mean, how, who told you I tried to look for this band? My friend Bill Bartell, who is, um, he has a record label called Gasatanka Records, and he was in White Flag, and he's friends with Red Cross. And he's a very nice guy. He has a mustache. And um, he's a really nice guy. 
and he and he sent me a tape of the first two records um, a, f a few weeks ago, about a month ago, mm -hmm. and I really liked it. And he said, if you go to Brazil, you have to you have to say to everybody that this is a great band, and I agree with him. I think this is this is a very influential and cool band for the time. How did it sound to you? I mean, does it have a, like a Brazilian? Kind of sound in the background. And yeah, there's a lot of Latin impression. rhythms in there in some of this music. Yeah, because they came with this idea that let's mix Brazilian rhythm and rock, and this, uh -huh. this was in the late '60s. Right. Can you can you say some something like typical from Brazil there? Yeah. Oh, definitely. There's some. I, I can hear the the rhythm and the influence in, in in the music a lot. I just I respect them so much. I'm just I'm not familiar with them very much because I've just started getting into mm -hmm. them, but I think. From what I've read about them, they were they were very revolutionary. I mean, they made their own effects boxes, you know. They they made their own fuzz boxes, and and they were also really controversial too, which was they had a lot of guts to be doing stuff like that in the, in the military um, society that was going on then. And I just think that is so cool. That was totally counterculture. Yeah, totally very. Like people wouldn't believe what they did. Yeah. Oh, it's very cool to like that. And yeah. I hope you enjoy the CD too. Yeah, I will. And thank you again. All right. Bye. <laughs>